We're all familiar with plastic. Lots of things we use every day are made from it. Cups, containers, furniture, even clothing. Plastic is an important material in our everyday lives. There's no doubt that plastics are useful, but plastic items can cause some serious problems once we're done using them. If you visit a landfill or take a walk in a lot of public places, you can see that all of our discarded bits of plastic are starting to pile up. It's clear that all this unwanted plastic is becoming a big problem for the environment. But is this a problem we can engineer a solution to? I visited a company called Metabolics, where engineers are working on new ways to address that very question. Derek, one of their biochemical engineers, talked to me about the kinds of plastics that are part of the problem today and some exciting possibilities they're engineering for the future. So why are plastics harmful to the environment? Plastics are harmful to the environment because uh, they accumulate in landfills and the, the trash and plastic just keeps piling up and piling up and piling up and there's, there's no means for that plastic to degrade so when you throw it away in the trash it's going to be there in 10 years and 100 years and 1,000 years. So can you tell me a little bit about um, the different types of plastic? So there are two main types of plastic. There's uh, conventional plastic, which is made from oil. And there's a new type of plastic called bioplastic. And bioplastic uh, are made from renewable resources, which are derived from plants, so from sugars or starches. To learn about the difference between conventional plastics made from oil and bioplastics made from plants, we need to zoom into the molecular level. All the stuff around us is made up of tiny molecules. The molecules that make up plastics are called monomers. When monomers link together, they form a chain called a polymer. You can think of a polymer like a necklace made up of individual beads, where each bead is a monomer. Sometimes, when a bunch of polymer chains tangle together, they can pull on each other and create a strong material. And that's what happens in plastics. In most conventional oil-based plastics we use today, the bonds between the monomers are so strong that they're hard to break down. That's why these plastics can sit in our landfills for thousands of years. In order to create a material that won't clog our landfills, Derek and his team needed to design a polymer with weaker bonds bonds that could be broken down over time. In other words, this new material needed to be biodegradable. The answer was bioplastics. Along with his team, Derek designed bioplastics using his knowledge of living things, chemistry, and an important tool called the engineering design process. The engineering design process is a series of steps engineers use to solve problems. In the case of plastics, engineers identified the problem, Plastics weren't biodegrading and they were piling up. They investigated possible solutions and realized that plastics made from plants could be the answer. Then they imagined innovative ways to solve the problem. I visited the lab to see one of the solutions that Derek's team had imagined. Let's start with uh, the glucose over here. This mm -hmm. is a renewable resource. It's made from plants. Yeah. This so it's, it's sugar water, right? It's sugar, it's, yeah, it's sugar water. If I wanted to, I could drink it. It's like a really, it would be like a really thick soda. <laughs> <laughs> that, it gets fed to uh, what's called a fermenter here. Mm -hmm. And inside the fermenter is mostly water, salts, that glucose solution, and uh, bacteria. And the, the bacteria are what uh, converts that glucose into uh, biodegradable plastic or bioplastic. Derek's team had engineered a process to convert the sugar solution into bioplastic. They added the sugar to a mixture called a broth and allowed the molecules in the sugar to be strung together to form a polymer. Since it's made from simple sugars, the bonds of this bioplastic can easily be broken down later by living things in water or soil. So when the broth is finished cooking, <laughs> what is it? What do you do with it? What does it look like? It looks like this right here. Uh-huh. And um, this like yeah, protein shake. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a protein shake, almost like maybe kind of like milk, but mm -hmm. a little bit thicker. Uh-huh. So it's Yeah, milky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it does have that consistency of like a protein shake cuz you know, there's there is a lot of protein in the broth. Mm -hmm. But mostly mostly that broth is is water and plastic. You know, what you're seeing now is, is really the result of, 
of literally thousands of, of experiments. Derek and his team planned, created, and tested thousands of formulations and processes for creating the broth. Each time they tried something new, they learned more about what worked and what didn't work. Then they used that knowledge to improve their designs. There's a big difference between a milky broth and a bioplastic spoon. How do you get from one to the other? To learn more, I met up with Mike. He's an engineer in the Metabolics Applications Lab. It's his job to take the product of that broth and turn it into lots of different bioplastic items with lots of different properties. So what we have here is a range of bioplastic materials and these are actually bioplastic materials that can have a range of properties that um, they can be very hard, they can be very soft and rubbery and then we can take a combination of those materials and turn it into an application such as this spoon here that's uh, a utensil that we use every day and it has just the right amount of strength but also the right amount of uh, softness uh, for the application that we're going to use it for. So that way it doesn't, it doesn't fall apart, it doesn't shatter in your mouth while you're eating with it, but it also doesn't bend over and all of your noodles spill off of it. That's either. right, that's right. In order to make bioplastics with lots of different properties, Mike and his team engineer lots of different recipes. Say you need a plastic that's rubbery. Mike adds bonds called crosslinks to the bioplastic. The crosslinks hold the polymer chains together so they can't slip by each other. Or what if you need a bioplastic that's really durable? Mike adds something called a plasticizer to the mix. The plasticizers push spaces in between the polymer chains. Then they can move by each other more easily, like when you add oil to a pile of sticky spaghetti noodles. Now you've got a bioplastic that's nice and flexible. We work on a lot of projects where somebody will want to take a a material today that is not biodegradable uh -huh. and make it biodegradable. So we start off with something that potentially they have today uh -huh. and we form what we would call a specification for that product. This is how strong it has to be, how stiff it has to be, um, we have to those also... Are your, those are your criteria. That's correct. Uh -huh. And then we also have to take into account the process of how this is going to be made. Mm -hmm. And then we will make that spoon out of a range of different materials which will be close to the finished article. And we look at those, the range of samples that we make and decide which one is the best, the closest to what our customer is going to need. Mike and his team use the engineering design process as well. They start by identifying how their bioplastic needs to behave. Then, they investigate which formulations of biopolymers they need to use to meet their criteria. Then, they create samples and test how well they respond to variables, such as physical stresses or extreme temperatures. The results of these tests help them continue to improve their recipes, so the final bioplastics created are a perfect match for the things they need to do. One test checks to see how a film, or a thin sheet of plastic, responds to extreme stretching. If you have a garbage bag mm -hmm. where if it starts to deform, you want it to be able to resist that deformation so that it will stretch a little bit and not break and leave all the shopping or garbage all over the floor. The engineers stretch, bend, heat, and even fire darts at their samples in order to figure out how the material will respond to stresses in the real world. They continue to test until their samples fail, so they know the limits of each bioplastic recipe. They expose bits of their bioplastic to the environment for long periods of time to see how long they take to biodegrade. Creating something that easily biodegrades is one of the main goals for bioplastic engineers, after all. Do you think we could ever get to the point where we don't use conventional oil-based plastics anymore and we're just using bioplastics? There is a continued sort of development in those areas and based on the results to date you can see the fact that one day sort of the majority of plastics would be made that way. And is that why the field of bioplastics is important and it's important to study polymers? Yeah, it's very important because mm -hmm. we're a growing population but we have a fixed space in which we have to live. So it's very important that we sort of control 
how polymers and plastics end up in the environment. Derek, Mike, and other engineers around the world have created some amazing new bioplastics. But we've got a long way to go before we can call our plastics problem solved. We need to continue to find better ways of making useful materials that don't pile up to become a problem when we're done using them. It will be up to the next generation of engineers to continue developing new materials that will allow us to maintain a responsible relationship with our environment. And that engineer could be you.